Welcome to the Revenue Builders Podcast, a weekly show featuring B2B sales leaders and executives. Hosted by five-time CRO John McMahon and force management co-founder John Kaplan, the show goes behind the scenes with the people who have been there, done that, and seen the results. If you enjoy our content, please subscribe, rate, and review the show to help us reach more people. Revenue Builders is brought to you by Force Management. We help companies improve sales performance, executing the growth strategy at the point of sale. Find us at forcemanagement.com. Enjoy today's episode. Hello and welcome to another episode of Revenue Builders. I'm joined by my friend and esteemed colleague, John Kaplan, also known as Cap. Thanks, Johnny Mac. Thanks, buddy. Good to see you. Good to see you, buddy. Hey, Cap, today we got a special guest that I had the pleasure of working with multiple times. This person started their career at PTC where they grew to run the UK. Then they ran EMEA sales for Essential Software before joining me again at Blade Logic as the director of Northern Europe. And after the acquisition of Blade Logic by BMC as a VP of EMEA. Since then, he's run EMEA sales for App Dynamics. He's been an investor in companies like Data Robot, Castori Software, or Sportswear. Sorry, Jeremy. And Multiverse. Cap, please help me welcome my friend, also known as the Ginger Prince, the one, the only Jeremy Duggan. <laughs> Jeremy, Thanks, dude. Jeremy, it's good to see you, buddy. It's been a while. Great to see you, lots. You know what? I've got um, I've got a jacket that I wear on special occasions, and I call it a triple threat jacket because it's it's black, it's leather, and it's by Tom Ford. It's a triple threat jacket. And I just realized on this call, this is a triple J threat call. We've got Johnny <laughs> Kane, right. we've got Big Johnny Mac, and we've got Jeremy Duggan. It's a triple J threat call, this. I'm that amazed is. the world's not imploding at this call happening. <laughs> But you're the king. You're the king. You're also the ginger prince, but you are the king of the UK, baby. You're the king. <laughs> Thank you. So, so, Jeremy, we are we are really, really fired up to have you. Um, how I remember you, dude, back in the day, uh, it's one of the, and I mean no disrespect by this, but it's one of the greatest young sales leaders that I've ever seen. And um, now seeing you on video, uh, these 20 some odd years plus later, um, and especially next to McMahon and I, uh, you don't seem to be aging, dude. You're, you're looking good, buddy. You're looking I know, good. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mixture of using serum in the morning, moisturizer at night, and having a kind heart. <laughs> <laughs> hey, brother, we went out to our listeners um, and we've asked, like, what are some great topics? Uh, for, you know, for our guests to discuss. And I'm going to tee this first question up because not only do I think it's right up your alley, but um, it is really, really top of mind for our listeners. And as Johnny said, you know, um, you helped App Dynamics grow from 23.6 million in revenue to a run rate of more than 200 million. Um, I read an article where you attributed that growth to what you called the three R's, which were recruiting, retention, and revenue. And I think that's a great place for us to start because uh, it, always, it always starts with talent. So would you mind kind of walking us through those concepts of the three R's? Yeah, no problem. I, get, I, I do get asked that asked, asked a lot. And look, you know, the, it comes from my kind of, you know, history of, of wanting to understand what excellence looked like from a fact based perspective, not, not from an opinion based perspective. And this all started back at PTC, right? You know, you, we, we had a, an incredible fast growing company there, but when you joined, you were under no illusion what happened if you weren't successful, right? And being, you know, young and full of fire and fury, I, I kind of couldn't have imagined anything more humiliating than, than losing my job. And so what I did was I started trying to look around at, at all the salespeople and thinking, well, why are these people, you know, doing well and these people aren't? And why, why do those two people, you know, both of them are good at PG, but one of them's doing well and one of them isn't. And so I was trying to, I was trying to figure out what were the, the facts that lay underneath 
somebody, you know, being successful and somebody else not being successful. And then as I got into leadership, I did the, the same thing. And as I got older and older, you know, Essential was a, got sold for a billion. Blade did as well. John, we added a few billion to, to BMC's valuation. App Dynamics was, was worth about 100 million when I joined and we sold for just under 4 billion. And Multiverse, where I'm at now, you know, me and, me and Stevie Mac joined two years ago and the company was doing 10 million and valued at 60 million. And this year, two years later, we'll, we'll do 100 million and we're wow. comfortably over a billion in valuation. And <clears throat> what I was trying to do with the three R's was was try and simplify the incredibly complex mission of building billion dollar companies in a way that was fact based so i knew that that it would work and also if in a way that was facts based so i could sell it to people because i never wanted to go to people and say you know here's what i think is the right thing to do let's just do it because you're asking for a lot of trust in people there and obviously at times in my life i've been so young in the jobs I've done, you can't ask that of people. So you have to win with, with, with data and with facts and with history and with logic. And so the, the three R's was born out of trying to say, well, how do you take a company that's, that's quite small and make it a billion dollar company? Because lots of companies don't succeed there. And when you go and study them all, it comes down to really at a high level, three things, which is if you recruit great people, and then you can you can retain and inspire those those great people, and then you have a fact based methodology around how to drive results. If you take care of those three things, then you've got a fantastic shot of building a really incredible company. And so that's that's where that came from was just just figuring that out at the start, saying they they're the things that companies tend to do, and then underpinning that with with training and development and knowledge and facts around all those those different areas. So that's kind of where it came from. Yeah, Jeremy, you've always done an amazing job recruiting, you know, top talent. And um, not only, you know, you talk about retaining, but you built an amazing team around you. Like every time I, you know, I come to the UK or Europe, I always felt like, oh, these guys are really tight. Um, and that speaks a lot to your leadership. But if you really go back to the recruiting priest and you want to give advice to young sales leaders, what would you say about what's the most important thing when you when you're talking about recruiting? Well, I, I think um, I mean there's there's two things for it. The first thing is 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 knowing what an A player looks like. You know, I, I kind of I do a lot of calls with you know with CEOs at the minute, and and I say to them, I say, hey, listen, what, what do you what's the most important thing you got to do? And then they all say they all say recruitment. Because that's the, the textbook answer. And I say, yeah, yeah. And, and who are you looking to hire? And they always lean forward like they've got, the, they've got the answer. And they go, A players. And I go, A players. Good. That's exactly what you're looking for. And I say, well, what, so what's an A player look like to you? And then they kind of get a bit shifty, you know, and look at their shoes and, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. And, 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 and then most of them, most people say experience. So then I say to them, well, so let's say you're hiring for a CMO. If you're looking for experience, that means you can hire every CMO in the world, right? Because they've all got that, that experience, but not every, every CMO is going to be right for you. So this, again, you know, all goes back to the, the data and the, and the historical knowledge and the science of building success, which is, again, I looked at what does an A player actually look like, right? Based on all the ones I've met that are great and, and all the people who maybe haven't made the mark. And it comes down to, we have different terminology, John. I know you use different terms, but it's pretty much the same thing, which is, yeah. you know, are they smart, intelligent? Do they have character? Things like resilience and determination and loyalty and honor. Those things are, are really important. And if you're going to go on a really difficult journey, which, which it is when you're building big companies, are they coachable, right? Do they want to learn? Do they want to progress? Do they want to get better? And, and at the end, you know, the, the last one is, is experience, which is a, really a nice to have, to be honest with you, because once you get a great process lined up, you can take people who have the first three qualities and not necessarily the, the, the last one and, and make them great. So I think that the first thing is, is really understanding what an A player actually looks like to, to recruit them. But then the second thing that I'm finding in the world right now, especially with the war on talent and 
all that kind of stuff is once you find those people they're, they're in demand in a, in a major way huge especially and, these days big talent yeah. wars out there and when you're when you're smaller john like you know you, you can't offer the same packages that right. the big guys are offering so you've got to offer something more and so i always look at it you know the way i talk to my leaders about it is it's it's really i break it down to four areas in terms of how you get great people the first one is you've got to join a company that can attract great people right and you know I always, I'm always, that's always front of my mind. I, you know, I've been working with Steve McCluskey, who's just a, an absolute superstar for about 18 years now. You know what he oh, says really? to me, John? He says, he says, hey, hey, Jeremy, he said, I've been working with you longer than I would have gone to prison for if I'd murdered somebody. <laughs> you get less time for murder than, than, than I've had working for you. So I've got to make sure that it's a it's a it's a company that that is going to appeal to, to a players. That's that's a, a first pass when you're looking for some something, and then once you're in and you, if you've chosen well, you then got to understand what what these people want, right? And again, if I go back to my research, they're looking for really two things. They want they want to be inspired, right? They want to leap out of bed in the morning, you know, loving what they do. They want to be inspired by the the job they're doing the opportunity they've got, the leaders they've got, the people around and that kind of stuff. And then they want to be developed, totally. you know? And, and because if you're taking somebody, you know, who joins your company from this position to at the end of that journey, their, their whole life, outlook on life, capability, opportunity is different. That's something that's the, the, the great people want. And then the, the final thing is, I think is the, the people join people, don't they? You know, I mean, I mean, I've, I joined, you know, Blade Logic because of you, John, you know, and then you, you kept us all in, in BMC when that happened. And as a leader, you know, you've got to inspire them. Can you sell that story of development credibly, right? Can you give these people the, the vision that they want in a way where they believe it? It's real for them because lo- lots of leaders talk a good game. But as, a, right. as, a, as the best leader, hiring the best talent, you've got to be able to, to deliver a good, good game. Do they believe you? Can you deliver for them? Will you deliver for them? Right? Is it going to be, you know, fun? Is it going to be, are, are they going to have a rewarding experience? And, and again, coming back to it all, can you look them in the eye and tell them and, and, and sell that vision in a way where they know they're going to get it from you because you've got the track record for it. It's your values. They believe in it. They believe in who you are all those things. And so if you get a great company and you know what people want and you're delivering that in your culture, and then you're the kind of leader that can inspire that in people, I find that they're the three, the three steps you've got to take. Yeah. And you want, when they join, A players want to be around other A players. You can't just talk the game and then recruit an A player. And the person comes in, they look to the left and they look to the right and they're seeing C players. They're not going to stay, you know? So you yeah. need to recruit A players. It becomes paramount to recruiting other A players. Well, even it, it works the other way as well, John. I remember when we were at App Dynamics, you know, we were growing so quickly, um, way, way quicker than John said at the start, by the way. John, John like, lowered that number by about 4X, right? I, I couldn't, I, I decided, I thought I was going to leave it because I'm all grown up and mature now. You mean cap, that's cap, not me. Oh, cap, yeah, John, right, Johnny K. Right. Be um, I'm, only, I'm only joking, John. <laughs> um, but, um, so, we, we, we were going so quick and then you, the, you know, you have to hire more and more people. And we got to a point once where the RDs were coming to me and Stevie Mack and saying, Hey, listen, we're, we're out of talent, right? We've got all the A players, you know, and, <laughs> and so we're going to have to, we're going to have to compromise. And so, do you know, even with all the experience we had at the time, we kind of hired three or four people that we, we knew weren't quite good enough. Mm. And, and then what happened was John, Within three months, they were, these, these, these kids were struggling and the A players were coming into our office going, what are we, we, we don't want to be great, any, great anymore. What's going right. on? Are you guys, you guys dropping the standards? It has and, a huge effect it, on your culture because of that, right? Now they, yeah. they start to look around and say, why are these people on the team? What, you're, yeah. it's, you're, not pre, you're not really fulfilling the, all the stuff that you've been preaching to us, right? Why yeah. are these people here? Yeah, no, no doubt. And you know, if you if if I take that back, John, to when we started off talking about the the three R's, right? If you if you obviously the recruiting bit you've got to get right, but when you 
when you get people in, the retention piece is about, I think, is about inspiring and developing people. But, but you know, you, you've got to, there's no good having that idea in your head. So this is what you were always brilliant at, John. And, and you know, John, this is, this is your living now and you're, you're the best in the world at it, which is you've got to be able to take this strategy and, and have everybody executing it, right, all the time. Because, you know, if you've got – I'll give you an example, right? So I, I talk a lot about, about excellence in, in everything at, at, at Multiverse and, you know, everywhere I go. And so there was a kid, a young kid, young – potentially great manager at Multiverse interviewing with me last week for the job, right? And when I talk about, about delivering great meetings, right, every meeting being delivered excellently, it's about have you done the right prep? Do you know who you're talking to? Do you know what they want to get out of it? Have you set an agenda ahead of time, sent them all the, the, the stuff? Is the call then going to be around talking about those things when you're prepared, you've got actions, and then you follow up, right? That's a great meeting. So this kid comes on the call and he hadn't done those things and I found out pretty quickly, you know, that he hadn't done his research. So he was exposed in the, right. the questions I was asking. So at the end of it, I say to him, listen, just think of it like this, right? We've got 500 people at Multiverse right now, and they're all doing, let's say, six calls a day, right? That's 3,000 calls a day going on at Multiverse, right? So in a week, I'm going to have to get my maths right here. In a week, that's 15,000 calls. Right in in a in a month, that's sixty thousand calls, and over the course of a year, that's just under eight hundred thousand calls. Now imagine if we did eight hundred thousand brilliant calls, right? How much further ahead the company will be than 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 where it is now? And so this kid like got it immediately, went back, set a follow up call the next day, came on. He knew more about me than I knew about myself, John. Right, he knew what colour socks I was wearing that day. The kid, and and he and he walked the interview right, and so you know part of the the kind of you know retention pieces is getting people to buy into to, to your idea, the development piece, getting people to buy into your ideas, showing them you know educating them and develop them, and then maintaining that you know you know sure. acting and, and and inspiring that when they when they leave the room, but making sure it gets out of your head. And into every single person in the company. So everything's being done excellently and against the strategy that you know that works. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Well, you One started, things- you know, many teams from scratch. So you can inspire when a lot of people are winning. But when you're just starting and you're building your team from scratch, it's really hard to inspire. And what you're trying to do as a leader is go get some wins so you can inspire the rest of the team, right? So can you talk a little bit about, you know, starting from scratch, which you have done a number of times? And, yeah, you know, think- it seems like to me, like as a leader, you only have a certain time frame to establish those wins to sell all the things you have been selling to these people and get them to buy in. Right. The longer it goes the har- and they're not winning, the harder it becomes to continue to inspire them. Yeah, yeah no doubt. I think I mean, that's beyond honest with you. That's where the, the data and the, and the facts are really useful, because what you're saying is don't just trust me. And the way I'm delivering it, trust the history and the data. So I'll tell you what I say. When I talk to, to, to leaders about the three R's or I talk to salespeople about the leading indicators, you know, we build the leading indicators for success. You know that, John, which if a salesperson does these six things, I always say in the history of time, they, joke, they take the mickey out of me. They say, well, the history of time, nobody's ever done those things and not hit a number. So what I say to people here is, I say, look, when I talk to you about leadership in the three R's or the, the, the leading indicators in sales, what I'm actually doing is I'm handing you the winning lottery numbers. Right. All you got to do is go down to the shop and buy a ticket, right? And I go through the detail of, of why this makes sense and, and the logic behind it, but also the data behind it where you, you're referencing this is this is – all these people achieved all these things through following this this playbook because that's the first thing you I call it the battle of the buy-in. You've yeah, got to get the buy-in into buy-in. the process, right? Yeah, exactly. Right, and then and then the, then the second thing is underneath the strategy, there's there's a way of executing it. So then you've got to educate and develop people around the education. So like if you say a leading indicator is 
doing, you know, booking one new business meeting and doing one new business meeting a week. Great. But then somebody can do a new business meeting and get a 20% conversion rate. Somebody else can do a new business meeting and get an 80% conversion totally. rate. Totally, yeah. But then you've got to look at, right, these are the high-level strategies, but how do we execute them to the absolute maximum to get the, to get the best results? And then that's the education and development process. You remember Blade Logic. You'd, you'd, you know, we'd get everybody in the room and we'd go through the four di- di- differentiators. I still got no idea what a configuration object dictionary is, right? <laughs> but, and I bet you, you don't want me to ask you because you don't know what, what is the either. Right, but it sounded great, man. And oh, the customer's man, like, well, wow, that's it. unbelievable. That sounds fantastic. We need one of those. And then, and so then once you've gone through that education development process, then then you, you've got to, the, the, then, like the way I look at it is like 5% of what you're doing is, is the ideas and the concepts of it. And then the 95% of it is the execution. So you've got to inspire it all the time because it's really hard to be great. And if you're totally. teaching people how to be great, by definition, it's going to be really tough for a while. So you've got to inspire them all the time. Don't worry, you'll get there. You know, lots of stories all the time about how people fell again and again and again. Yeah. Or got up again and again and again. But then you also got to, make sure you're inspecting it as well. And sometimes people get crazy about the concept of inspection. You know what I mean? They think it's micromanagement and stuff like that. Yeah. But it's too much sometimes the, with some people. Every, but, but every company in the world, John, inspects what's happening in the business. It's, totally. you know, it's no to. different to anything. And I think it also depends on the intent as well. Because if you're a leader and you're checking somebody's progress so you can report that to big Johnny Kaplan, otherwise he's going to shout at you, right? You're doing it to make yourself look good. Then people are going to be picked. That, that is, you know, inspection for no purpose. But your true purpose for inspection is, is to help someone, to develop. To develop, people. develop the right? people, yeah. If they, if they know that your, own, your sole purpose in, in getting information about their business is so you can see where they're going well, so you can share it with others, and where they may be struggling so you can help them. And actually, nobody really cares about inspection anymore because it's a mechanism for, for, for improvement. Because they know you have their best interests at heart. That's why. That's, exactly. that's the most important thing. But it has to be genuine. It has to be authentic. Otherwise, no people could feel it, right? That's where I think a lot of leaders go wrong. I think, I think they, they get a forecast or they look at Salesforce or HubSpot or they look at you know how many economic buyer meetings you're doing and they're doing it so... They can put it in a spreadsheet or they can they can talk to somebody above them about what's going on. Right. And and it's never about going up. It's all about helping people underneath you. Because if totally. you figure out a way to make them all great, everyone above you is gonna love you anyway, aren't they? Jeremy, yeah, you are <clears throat> you are one of the again, you still look young. Um, so to me, you're still incredibly youthful. <laughs> But you, He's I not love your. Any of the juice can, can we can we eat. can we dig in a little bit more on that point, John? We're, we're going to, <laughs> we're going to, um, because I remember reading something about you. By the time I met you, I think I'm, I'm almost positive you were leading when I came over to Europe. I think you were leading in the UK, mm-hmm. um, in all of these things. The things for my for for our listeners that I'm just so ecstatic. I watched you do all of this and and just watch you create a dominant team um, in the UK, not only in Europe but in the company. <clears throat> but your first attempt to become a leader, to become a manager, was actually thwarted by a one of your leaders and, and, and I've read an article of your, one of the speaking engagements you gave where he said, you didn't have what it takes to be a successful manager at the time. So I, I really want to just kind of sit with that for a second because knowing who you are today, getting the, and I want you to think about the listeners that we might have that says, well, how do I become a Jeremy Duggan? How do I, um, I'm young, I'm intelligent, I have great character. I have, I receive this information really well. Um, how do I become this great leader? How do I make this moniker for myself? Could you tell us a little bit about that journey, that experience? Yeah, I mean, he was right. The guy who said it to me for the reason that he said it. And, and because what he was saying was I, was, I was a great sales guy, 
but I didn't really know why because I was I was naturally, you know, um, I had a naturally good work ethic. I was naturally resilient. I could get on with people, you know, in in, in, a, in a good way. And and he said to me, how are you going to manage five people that, that aren't like Jeremy Duggan? And because you don't have this this thought process behind it. And so, you know, it, it was it was that that really started me down the the, the line of of trying to trying to educate myself on what great things look like. Like, you know, it's the same when you make it like when you make a mistake, right? You know, people that sometimes say to me, Well, what big mistakes have you made? And I, I always answer that by saying, I can't really remember big mistakes even though I know I've made loads of little ones, because for me, the whole point of making a mistake is that you immediately recognize it and then you figure out why you did it. So you don't do it again. So then you don't kind of remember it, right? Because you've, you've fixed it. And so this, this constant kind of self coaching, self learning, listening to people around you, striving to get information, all it's doing is is making you stronger and stronger and stronger as in, in, in whatever you do. And so if you look at the leadership thing, that advice I was given, I didn't sulk about it or start crying. I kind of took it on board and thought, well, okay, let, let me see if I can go and, and do some more fixing that. And so what I did was I studied what made what made leaders great. I, I learned about it. I kind of made myself more knowledgeable about it than almost they did because I was speaking to a lot more people, uh, you know, about that kind of stuff. And so, um, so then I was able to, to get to, together a, a base of data and knowledge on what it took to be great. And then once I figured out that, it was about then educating the people in the team and, and, and you know, getting them on board with it, and like I just talked about. So I, I think that... that you know, one of the things that that keep, that keeps you be gets you to be great, but then keeps you there is realizing that, that the world's always moving and it's always changing, and you've got to stay on top of all the new things that are coming up. M- trying to make yourself better all the time. I feel as though, like in every job I've done, I've got better and better and better. And I always take a little gap at the end, you know, because it's like it's really difficult to analyze a performance in the middle of a game, right? But at the end of the game, when you look at the, 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 the real, the highlights, you can look and say, I could have done that a bit better. So after Blade Logic and BMC, I took nine months out and I studied what I did well and, and tried to add to it. And I studied what I didn't and tried to replace it and then went to App Dynamics. And I was better at App Dynamics. And then when I left App Dynamics, I took nine months out and said, OK, well, what, went, what could I have done better at App Dynamics? And then come to the multiverse, I think I'm even better. So it's constantly thinking how you can evolve and get more knowledge to help you get, get better. Kind of a waffly answer, John. I don't know if that answered your question. No, I love it. I absolutely love it. And it's such great advice to the listeners. You have to participate in your own rescue and you have self-awareness and self-reflection. You don't wait for anybody to tell you to give you the feedback. You give yourself the feedback first is what I heard you say. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's also, outstanding also the advice. people around you. You know, I remember, remember John at Blade Logic ran me up. <laughs> and he said, hey, Duggan. And I said, hey, John, you know, John, everybody, when I do an American accent, it's always a John McMahon accent. So everybody who knows, <laughs> like, it doesn't matter who I'm doing in America, it's always John McMahon. So he rings me up, hey, Duggan. I said, hey, John, how are you doing? He said, good. Do you want to know the book on Jeremy Duggan? And I said, there's a book about me? Fantastic. I'll definitely read that. I said, no, I don't think you understand, buddy. And he said, he, he was saying, um, I think you give me 99% of the information. Do you remember saying that, John? And no, you said say that it one more time. What did you say? You said, you said people get a sense from you that they get 99% of the information, but not the 1%. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, you know, you, you said, I always feel like there's some trickery going on <laughs> that right, you're not letting right. me know about. Yes. And, um, and so, again, that's an example where I listened to it and, and, and I thought, he's right. And but but what why does he care about that? Because I'm always doing my number. And and then when I broke it down, I realized that I was doing it because I don't like to go pe- to people with problems, right? I like to go to people with solutions. So if a problem came up, it wasn't that I didn't want to go to John, it was just like I'd rather fix it because John's got his plate full. 
But then, I, so then I thought to myself, well, that's a good thing. So why, why, is, why does John want to know about it? And then I went to John and said, told him why I didn't do it. And he says, yeah, but I could help you. It's my job to help you. So, so he said, don't, don't, you know, fail alone, mate. And so then, and so that immediately clicked with me. And ever since then, I've gone full circle and had full transparency for, for good or for, for bad. And there's been lots of times in my, I didn't realize that just that little thing was impacting a, 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 the way a lot of people looked at me and thinking I was, wasn't honest and stuff like that. And John popped it out of me and then that fixed it straight away. Well, sometimes, you know, because you were, you, you know, everybody called you the PG King, you know, pipeline generation King. So, and you were so good at, you know, building pipeline and getting your people to build pipeline that you always made your number. So then what happened is it seemed like, well, he's masking a lot of problems that do exist simply because he is absolutely the PG King, right? So then I always wanted to know, and that's when I would kid with you is to, you know, Doug, and I know you got problems, but you're so good at building pipeline. I can't figure out exactly what the problems are, but, but I know you got problems. And you're like, John, I don't have any problems. I'm like, yeah, okay, <laughs> bullshit. You got problems. <laughs> I just no, don't know where much, John, It was a drinking problem I had. That was the problem. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, that, I guess you're going back to the point is that, that, you know, even John, when he positioned that to me, he was almost saying it, it wasn't a problem that the results weren't there. It was something he picked up that was maybe holding me back. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it, again, it's, and sometimes I see a lot of people, you know, they get advice and, and they either, they kind of shrug it off a little bit. And even, even when I got advice that at the, at the, at the start, I didn't agree with, I'd, I'd analyze it. And I might come to the conclusion in some cases that I, I wasn't, you know, I was comfortable that that, that wasn't a problem. But I considered it and, and because I was always thinking, how can I get that extra 1% today? How can right. I get that? How can I move it for just a little bit? Because if you add all those little bits up together over a career, it's the difference between being good and being the best. Yeah, Jeremy, you know, like you've always had this exceptional ability to disarm people, like with your charm and uh, charisma. And then as a leader, what I've seen in some organizations is a lot of people try to emulate like their leader or their boss, but they're not really being themselves. Like Jeremy Duggan is Jeremy Duggan. Other people are who they are, but a lot of people don't actually figure out who they really are and then use their own unique characteristics to be themselves. Like, have you ever had any conversations with some of your people where you see that you could tell they're trying to be somebody that they're really not and they're not really introspective enough to fi figure out who they really are and use those skills and knowledge and characteristics to be better at what they do? Yeah, definitely. You know, that the, the, the first evidence I saw of that, and you two will be really familiar with this, was, was at PTC with you and Dick Harrison. Yeah. Right? Because, because you, you, you guys had a way where you could be, you could be funny, you could be charming, you could be tough, but but in a way where it didn't make you feel bad, you know. And then there was it grew so quickly that we we had we we started developing all these leaders that would try to be Dick Harrison and John McMahon, but they would do it with no charm or charisma. So they ended yep. just just coming across like bullies. I think, you know, I think that boils down to again. I always like to keep things. What we're trying to do here building these big companies is really complex. So I try and always boil it down into simple, simple things. And so if I look at like leadership, I think you need two things to, to get into a leadership role in the first place. And it, and, and the, you've got, you've got to be credible, right? There's no point. I could be the best leader in the world, but if I come over and try and coach an American football team, I haven't got a chance because I don't know, you know, I don't think it should be called football for stars, right? Because right. the world has football and you just nicked it off us, right? You guys yeah. need to get over that, though. <laughs> I'm not ready to, John. I'm not ready to. Um, so, um, so you've got to have credibility in the people that you can manage. And then fundamentally, you've got to care about people. You right? have to care. That's absolutely it. Yeah. Because if you care about people, it overcomes 
a, a, a lot of things that you might do wrong, right? You might you might have a bad day. You might you might lose your temper on something. You know, you might get something wrong. But if people know you fundamentally care about them, right? Then then they'll change. And so what I always say to the leaders in that situation, John, I'm I'm happy to talk to people and say, look, you know. The fundamentals that got you into being a great IC, intelligence, character, coachability, you've got those things in spades, right? They're the things that you need to be excellent at any job. Now, we can add to that now credibility because you've been a top performer. And I know how much you care about people. They're the only two things you need to be a great leader. Now, you've got to find your way, right, of, of leading to make to, to get the to you know to to inspire people and develop people, that kind of stuff. But you're not going to do it in the way that Kaplan does it. You're not going to do the way that McMahon does it. You're not going to do the way that McCluskey does it. You've got to find your way. But fundamentally, you've got credibility and you care about people. And as long as people know that, you can do all the stuff that we talk about. You don't have to be somebody that you look up to, right? In in for, for something. Figure out what you're good at and 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 that that'll be enough, you know. That makes sense. Yeah, for sure. Is that, is, that, is that what you would have done in that situation? I always feel like I want to sit people down just like I did with you. And I always say, you know, hey, Jeremy, you know, what's the book on you? And then I try to see how self-aware people are of the way other people perceive them. Right. That's that's really huge, especially as a salesperson. You got to know about how you come across and especially as a leader. How do you come across to, as to other people? people. So I love asking that question because I want to see, can they match what the book really says about them when they're not around versus the way they want to describe themselves? And sometimes they, in that first part of that conversation, they want to describe themselves differently than the way they really are. But if you keep pushing them a little bit, but you're not giving them the answers to the test, a lot of times they will admit, hey, I do have some issues here, some character flaws that I need to work on. And then that becomes a really good conversation where you can say, yes, it's exactly why we're having this conversation. And I'm here to help you overcome those things and become a much better leader. So yeah, absolutely. I think the problem you had with me, John, when you had that conversation with me was you said, tell me the book on Jeremy. And when I figured out what you meant, I think I said, people probably think I'm really cool, good looking and intelligent. And that's That's the end of this discussion. And That's then I for think sure. yeah, Absolutely. Had a moment of silence. And charming. You left out charming <laughs> and charismatic. You had a moment yeah. of silence when you thought, dude, what? Let me tell you what the book on Jeremy is and was, which was always really impressive to me. You were always one of the early adopters of data. And back in the day, like I think my first experience of knowing I was a little exposed is when that book Moneyball came out and Jeremy, it, it's, it's about American yeah, baseball or yeah, worldwide crazy. baseball or whatever. But and, it's not, it's American baseball. I think the last World Series was, be, was, was between Tampa and New York. Does that yeah. sound like the world to you, John? Uh, buddy, I'm trying not to offend you, <laughs> but if you want to go toe to toe about soccer and football, we'll do it. All right. So, um, but what I noticed about you was you were not intimidated. I don't know what your background is, if you have financial background or not. I, you know, it, it appeared that you did. I'm not sure if you do. But you were not intimidated by the data. So everything we've talked about thus far, I'd like you to kind of give some advice to our listeners. I myself don't see how you can lead in today's environment. You can be charismatic. You can be credible. You can care. Uh, because there's so much data available today, if you don't have the ability to use the data in all of those leadership principles you guys have been talking about, I think you're really exposed and at risk today. Could you comment on your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I can comment just by simply saying that you you couldn't be more right because you think about it, John, is like, how do you develop somebody when you don't have data on them? Right? How can you see what's going wrong in a team when you don't have data on it? Right? And so yeah. you, you, it's impossible. I mean, you, you, you're looking around for a light bulb in the dark. That's what you're doing without data. And so it's, it's really simple, really. You've got two things you've got to do. You've got to know the data that you need to make those decisions. Right? And then you've got to, you've got to find a way where it comes to you in a, in a simple way and digestible way, 
Let's I, ask, I, let's stay on that one right there because <clears throat> can, can you give us your experience about being the leader, being the sales leader, the CRO, and how incredibly important it is to have people around you like in operations and finance to be able to, you don't want people just pushing data at you. You want to be telling them, this is the data that I need, or what's the combination and how critical is that role when you show up and you're, and you're thinking about going to a company or taking the next job? What, what's that role like from an operations perspective on um, having the data available for you? Is that a comp- did I make it too complicated? No, no, you didn't. No, I mean, okay. at, at AppDynamics, we, we, we had a guy called uh, Tom Levy. He's now yeah. doing the same thing at Data Robot. And, and he, he came in and he, he was fascinated by the concept of, of how much information is out there. And I used to say to him, if you give me a spreadsheet – with you know 27 tabs underneath it i'm going yeah. to look at nothing yeah right if totally. you give me a spreadsheet with a few uh, you know a few rows and columns with core data i'm going to look at it every single day so some people they 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 think that the the more data you have it shows you in control right it's like the same people right. who think the more complicated something is and they can explain it it makes them the cleverest yeah and there's a genius in simplicity right because you can't do something with 17 tabs in the spreadsheet. There's nothing you can do about it. You've got to hunt for hours just to get the right thing. So what this, I said to, the, I said to Tom, I said, look, we've got to find it because you know that, that if, you, if I get the right data, I'll act on it, right? And this is what sales ops people like, you know, because oftentimes sales ops, they, they do provide a lot of this data, but no one does anything with it, right? And so then, yeah. they, then, then they lose heart and then they don't know what data should be providing because no one's given them any feedback anyway. So that link between, you know, any business person, right? You, you know, not just, not just salespeople and, and operational people who are providing information is crucial. This, the, the functional leader needs to know what data they need to see what's going on with individuals and people so they can know where the problems are, how they can fix them. The operational people need to make sure they can provide that data in a simple, digestible way Right and feel good that something's going to be done about it. If you don't have that, either of those two things, like this is why you know some of the some of the worst sales leaders in the world have the best Salesforce dashboards. Yeah, right. Yeah. But it, I want to jump in here though too. Like I want to jump in because I think data is okay, but for me, I feel like leaders have to be very intimate. I use that word intimate with their people also. Right. So if you're intimate with each individual and look at them as individuals, not cookie cutter then you know what their strengths and weaknesses, fears, insecurities, doubts, all those types of things and goals are, you know, everything about that person. And then you have to apply the data to that specific individual. And I can give you guys case and cases in point. We've worked with people like Marty Cardi, Paul Kant, Mark Musselman. These are people that you couldn't jam into a sales process the way that everybody else needed to be jammed in there. Why? Because these people were what I call artists. They could do certain things, you know, unconsciously that the rest of us need to have three or four steps to do. And taking that data and just cookie cuttering it onto Paul Kant, Marty Cardi, Mark Musselman would have probably killed those guys in a sense that you probably would have ran them out of the organization. So I think it's a, it's a tight balance between being very intimate with your people and applying the data, not applying the data as if it's all cookie cutter individuals. Right. That's well, my I, no, it's, I, I get that. Cause we've talked about this before, John, I'll, I'll just, I'll add to that point and provide a little bit of a counter, right. Which is, which is like, if you have data and that, you know, drive success, right. And you get an artist then positioned in the right way, that data can make the artist better. So Paul, sure. Kant, I would, Paul, right. Paul that's Paul what I mean by positioning Paul was, it Paul the, the right biggest, way. Exactly. Yeah, Paul was the biggest fan of the leading indicators because it allowed him to, to take facts and logic about being great, plus his artistry equals the best in the Absolutely. world. So you've just got to sell it right. If you just say, right, you're doing that, Musselman, and, and get on with it. If you don't do it, you're out. He's going right. to go. But if you say this is how you become the best in the world consistently, 
they'll, they'll more likely to listen. Yeah, because going back to your earlier point, those people that I mentioned, they could have three deals that had an 80% chance of closing. They didn't need 20 deals that yeah. had a 20% chance. That's not how they operated because they were different. Yeah, and but if they wanted to do five, if they wanted to do 600% and they've got eight deals and they can close them all, that's when they make millions, isn't it? Totally. So it's a, it is that balance and applying yeah. it to, like you said, that. in the right way, right? Yeah. Where were yeah. you in our QBRs, Jeremy, when nobody would uh, – counter John McMahon. That was a very productive conversation. Um, Where were you? <laughs> he was well, there. Me, me, and John, me and John used to do this. You know, you, you know, you, you're talking earlier on about, about like, you know, being, being quick and stuff like that. You know, this is, this was my first experience with John was, was, was this, which is, I, I told you this story once, John, and you, and I remember you saying, you remembered the story, but you didn't know it was me. But when I first joined PTC, right, I can't remember where it was. It might have been a new hire the first time. You know, John was the, the head of worldwide sales, wasn't he? And John, had to, you had to do your training. And at the end, they said, John McMahon's going to come in like he's this big, scary dude. You know what I mean? And, you know, I'm from Newcastle, so I'm, I've got a bit of swagger. So I'm thinking, who's this guy? And, and you know, why, why is he so scary? And everyone is like, oh, John's coming in. And he said, he's going to pick somebody. Do you remember associativity, John? Absolutely. Bi directional. Bi directional association. <laughs> so, so then I, so I thought to myself, well, I'll, you know, I'll nominate myself. So John comes in, he stands there, don't he? Like John, like a cowboy, like a gunslinger. <laughs> yeah. Who wants to tell me about associativity. So I said, I'll, I'll do it. So I get up on stage and he says, one thing, do it so your mother would understand it. And I was like, oh my God, I'm screwed. Because I was 23. I didn't know how to spell engineering and I had a, <laughs> and I had an English degree. So I go up and I do the worst, the worst explanation of associativity ever. And I finish and there's a hush over the room. <laughs> Everyone thinking, is he going to, is he going to chop his head off first or just take a leg? And then John, <laughs> I turn to face John and he's looking at me the way a shark would look at a healthy lunch. <laughs> right. And he says, and your mother would understand that. And I said, <laughs> yep. And he went, how? And I said, she's got a degree in mechanical engineering. <laughs> and the, and the, 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 honestly, there was like the, the air got sucked out of the room. And he looked at me for what felt like about 43 years. And he went, smart ass, huh? Sit down, buddy. That was the first buddy I got from John McMahon. <laughs> oh, uh, I, remember, I remember those days. Jeremy, do you remember being in the room when... Uh, and this is this is really kind of a great point. Like one of the things that I loved about John when he was leading us was um, he never expected us to do anything that he wouldn't expect himself to do. And we I, we went to some meeting and he was like, OK, get up and tell me about Mechanica. You remember Mechanica first came and it's a oh, simulation simulation product. You got to be a PhD to use it. And they're freaking asking Kaplan to go sell the PhDs. And, uh, and he gets people up and asks them to get up, stand up and talk about Mechanica. And the way that you ended it, John, was really powerful is that you explained it to us in mm -hmm. very, very simple terms. And right. I never forgot it. I was like, okay, as a leader, do not ask your people things that you cannot do yourself. And that was a really, really, really good message. Yeah. So I think part of the thing you were doing also by going down to those, uh, you were getting intimate with people to, to meet the new recruits and stuff, but you were also showing them development's important. Yeah, trying to lead from the front too. Yeah, hey, Jeremy, I, I want to switch gears good. just a little bit. So one of the th most valuable things that, I mean, you'd, you've done a lot of amazing things, but one of the things that you really brought to a lot of people was what you call the value pyramid. And for people that haven't heard about that, can you just give them like a quick little overview of what the value pyramid is and why it's so powerful with C-level executives? So for people that are listening, Jeremy developed his value pyramid. And when he and his team would get meetings with the economic buyers, they would be shocked at the level of understanding that Jeremy and his team had about the company. And it li literally 
didn't differentiate just the company, but it differentiated Jeremy and his team and put them on a different plateau than other salespeople. You just walk the, you know, listeners through that just a little bit. Yeah. I mean, again, John, like everything, it came just from me trying to, you know, solve a problem. And, and, um, I used to look at, I used to look at the pain I went through to get new business meetings, right? Sitting on the phone, making a hundred calls a day, not putting the phone down. And then my hit rate, you know, when I was younger was like 25%. And I was thinking, wouldn't it be brilliant if it was a hundred percent, I could do four times less pipeline generating. And then I thought to myself, well, maybe I won't get to that, but surely it should be better than 25%. So, so what's stopping me? And so then what I did was, I started with the, with the executives that, I, that I'd built as champions. I would go to them and say, what is, it, what is it that you like? What is it that you want out of speaking to somebody, right? Versus what you don't want. And, and I remember pretty much all of them saying, every salesperson comes in and they effectively show their brochure, right? They say, this is what, you know, this is, this is what we do, right? What do you think about it? And, and one, of them, one of the guys said to me, how long does your new hire last? And I said, well, it depends if you get away with associativity with John McMahon. It can be cut short pretty quickly. Um, but I said, it's about a week. So he said, so you expect me in effectively a 30-minute meeting to understand what you do and, and apply it to my company, right, in 30 minutes? No chance. So I said, well, what, what would you want us to do then? He said, well, come and do your research, man. And I thought... It's obvious, right? So then what we did was we built this, this value pyramid and it's easy to get the information, right? You can read a, a, a chairman's letter, a CEO's letter, and it basically says, you, you know, looks at how a chairman looks at a company or a CEO looks at the company saying, these are the external influences. You know, it might be COVID, it might be the exchange rate, it might be economic crisis. Here's our strategic response. Here's the, the strategies we put in place. Here's how we're implementing them. And then... So what you can do is in like three, four, four buckets, right? With a, a, not a massive amount of research, understand exactly what that company's trying to do. And then what you do at the end of it is you say, here's how we can help. We can't help with these things, but we can help here. Now, <clears throat> the, the, you get two things out of that. The first thing you get is that even if they don't understand what you do, they can understand areas that you can help, which if it's important to them, which it probably is, because it's in the value pyramid, then they can go, okay, well, I do need help on that. And that's quite a good way. So that happens. The second thing, and this is the main thing, actually, you stop being the 99% of salespeople who show right. up and try to flog something. Totally. Hey, listen, here's what I've got. It's fancy any of it. Nope. All right. See you later. And you go on to be the, you go on to the next customer. You've, you're the guy that's gone in and you've taken the time to research and you respected them. You respected their time. You respected their position. And you said, I genuinely think I can help you here, right? And here's how. And my, my hit rate went from 25 to 75% overnight when I, when I figured that out and it stayed there. And the deals became much bigger. Oh, much, much bigger. Because it's like, it's like Jesse James, isn't it? You, you know, why do you sell the executives? It's like he said, why, why do you sell the banks? Why do you rob banks? And he said, that's where the money is. Yeah. <laughs> that's why you sell the executives, right? Exactly. That's where the money is. And exactly. that happens quicker. Jeremy, we could go on for, I mean, so many golden nuggets. Johnny, I'm just going to do a quick summary here. Okay. Uh, we right. started off the conversation <clears throat> talking about talent. And, you know, you talked about creating an environment that's going to, you talked about, you know, um, intellect and you talked about characters, the things that you're looking for. But then you also said, you know, what they're, what, 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 your candidates are looking for is, you know, you got to appeal to the A players. You got to be, know what they want and inspire them and develop them and people join people. And you got to be able to sell the vision, which was a big takeaway on talent right now. It's not just about what you're looking for. It's about what the talent is looking for. Uh, you talked about self-awareness, <clears throat> trying to make sure you didn't make any big mistakes. I love the points you made about the gaps and the gaps in the end were taking a little break and assessing where was I good and where could I improve? So when I roll into the next role, I am constantly improving. And you talked about kind of having a mindset of continuous improvement. 
I heard you say full transparency in your conversation when Johnny was talking to you about you're only giving me, you know, 99% and, and you bro broke it down to full transparency. And John's answer was, if the 1% is you're, you know, you're, you're worried about, you know, me seeing that you're going to be stuck. It's my job to help you get unstuck. That was a very powerful exchange that I took away. You talked about credibility and, and, and uh, you have to care on leadership attributes. Uh, and then we talked about just the, the importance of the data and John kind of talking about it's data with intimacy um, or intimacy with data, which I really, really liked. And it's the art and the science coming together. And the last thing you talked about, Jeremy, was the importance of the value pyramid to make yourself relevant, attach yourself to the biggest business issues that your customers are experiencing and make yourself relevant. So the call is instantly warm versus cold. Um, so dude, you have been, uh, you've been an absolute joy. We could, we're probably going to have to have him back, Johnny. To, right, we uh, have to have part two. I mean, we just, yeah, we're going to have to have part Jeremy two. Dug in. The guy's a lot. You don't, there, John, you don't cause, cause what happened there is John has summarized my 50 minutes of absolute drivel in the, in the, a minute and a half. So you don't even have to listen to the podcast. <laughs> just, just put that two minutes on, John. No chance, you buddy. You have the John Kaplan version and the, the Jeremy Duggan waffling on version. That's the way to do that. We're uh, going to have you back no, but We sure, have to brother. have you back, brother. We have for to sure. have you back. There's a lot more to Jeremy Duggan than just this, you know, last, you know, 45 minutes for sure. Before we let him go, Johnny, can I do yeah. the, uh, can I Let's do, do the, it. Rapid fire. Yeah. So Jeremy, what we like to do is just to just kind of leave it on a fun note. And uh, knowing you, this is going to be really, really fun. Uh, we're just going to hit you with a couple of rapid fire questions. And if you're up for it, you ready? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Your ideal day off work. I don't know. Watching Chicago PD on repeat. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> That's you know, you know, you have, you, have you seen it? Have That's you seen the last it? thing that I would have thought from Jeremy no. Duggan. Yeah. So, so, what, so Sergeant Hank Voigt is, is the John McMahon of the cops. What happens is if there's a baddie, but they can't get evidence on him, Sergeant Hank Voigt goes, at the end of every episode, he goes, you and me are going to go for a ride. And that means you're not coming back from that ride. That's how he <laughs> solves crime. I love it. I love it. I love that. How about your favorite meal, brother? Probably burger and chips. I'm from chips. Newcastle, you know what I mean? Yeah, burger and chips, you know what I mean? Love it, love it. Favorite movie? Uh, do you want the real answer or or, yeah. or, or, or like what I wanted? I, I, I want to say something like, you know, The Godfather, but it's really either Annie or The Sound of Music. Right? Oh, buddy, <laughs> we don't have enough time to dig in there. I mean, we're, you're coming back just to talk about those. We want to hear more about Mary Poppins. <laughs> I don't like that. I don't like that because I can't have that Dick Van Dyke doing a rubbish English accent. He ruined it, but Annie, you know, <laughs> Annie's great, man. Hey, man, the last one and leaving on a serious note, we like to, um, we love to have our guests talk about the charities that are important to them. So the last one is your favorite charity and why? Um, well, um, it's, it's called Save the Children UK. And um, I mean, it does work way beyond the UK. And they're just, I mean, you know, kids, man, you know, vulnerable kids, there's, there's nothing more heartbreaking than seeing people in that situation. Me and, Tom, me and my son, Tommy, we, um, we, we raised $150,000 for, for them uh, by climbing Kilimanjaro um, a couple of years ago. And it was, it was, I mean, it was a great experience. I mean, it, it, it wasn't pleasant. You, you know, and in a lot of reasons, and and there's things that happen to your body which are, I don't want to go into detail in public, but it was just amazing to do that and 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 do it for the charity. So that I mean that that's that's one I I look after a lot. So the charity is called Save the Children, right? Yeah. And we'll make sure that the uh, <clears throat> that the producers put the uh, put that that a link to that in the show notes. And Jeremy, I'm going to let Johnny <laughs> wrap up and say goodbye. But dude, it's so great to see you. Thank you for being with us. Um, you're, you're a beast. Appreciate you. Thanks, man. It's a, it's a pleasure, John. It's great Jeremy to see you Jeremy Duggan, the Ginger Prince. It was very, very special honor to have you on. We can't wait to have you back on, brother. 
Enjoy yourself. Enjoy. Great to see I'm you. Good. Looking fantastic, but you didn't tell us about that juice you're using. It, you know, I don't. I don't use juice. It's pop tarts, John. That's what they do. <laughs> Put them in the toaster for two seconds. Take them out. That's all you need. All right. It's a pleasure, Jeremy. John. Great seeing you. Good to see you, man. Jeremy, Ciao, thank Jeremy. you, and Ciao. thank our listeners for listening to the Revenue Builders. Thanks for listening to today's episode. Be sure to check us out at forcemanagement.com. 